come to our fourth into this bonfire. And uh, I could go on about introducing the agenda, except I promised there is no agenda. So just welcome and we'll talk to each other and discuss whatever we want and see who joins us. Uh, and uh, I will start. So I'm a physicist, I live in Jerusalem, and I got into information overload during the second half of my 26 years at Intel, where I was a principal engineer. And I was computing productivity manager, which means I was in charge of figuring how to make Intel employees more effective in their use of computers and communication tools. And that is when I co-founded the, the Information Overload Research Group, actually, in 2007, it was no eight. And uh, this time I've left Intel some years ago and I'm consulting and I'm mentoring startup companies and advising students and speaking and so on. So I'm basically doing whatever I want to do. And if you want more about me, just Google me and go check my website. There's more than enough stuff there. So let's continue. Let's start with Henry. Henry. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Um, uh, Henry Kim, I, uh, I started a, uh, an email software business company to, to help folks easily manage their inbox. Uh, my background has always been in Boolean querying and text analysis. And that's kind of what led me down this whole journey of trying to solve information overload. My, my thesis is if we can help folks search more effectively using the, the existing technologies that are available today, uh, life would be a whole lot easier. It's just a lot of folks just don't know how to do this. And that's kind of my mission to, to try to show the world how to run effective searches, whether it's creating a, a keyword filter for your inbox or, you know, running an advanced search in whatever platform you use. Uh, but I'm, yeah, that's my mission. And uh, I'm based in Austin, Texas currently right now in uh, upstate New York. Okay. Okay. I'm going counterclockwise on my screen which of course you can't see, but Nina, it's your turn. Nina, can you unmute? Oh, hi, yeah, sorry. Uh, hi, um, I'm Nina Dakua, and uh, professionally I'm a data architect. Uh, so I have been working in, I have been working in many different companies as a data architect. As a, as a data architect, I do modeling, uh, you know, data management, data strategy, all kinds of stuff. So data is very, of course, we have an overload of data as well, right? That's where the big data came into place. So now uh, data is always connected with the information. So I got interested in information overload, these activities when I was in IBM, but later on, uh, I think uh, last November around that time, I joined this group. So it's fun because this is a topic, it's uh, bothering so many people and uh, it has such a wide discipline, more topic. So I would love to see some solution, be part of the solution. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa, your turn. Um, I work for IBM Steel. And I was interested in seeing what, how this might have morphed from just managing email into managing Slack and other online messaging tools. We have moved very much away from email and into Slack. And my list of channels that I have to follow for Slack is like over a hundred. So yeah, so that's become my that's become my bigger issue than email these days. So just curious about what 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 strategies y'all have for that. Thank you. Marge. Hi there. So I'm prior IBM as well, um, 38 years. And uh, retired two years ago and then started working at a health tech startup. Um, I joined Information Overload Steering Committee about two years ago as well. And um, looking just to help people sort through the volume of information to be efficient and effective, both in my personal life as well as others and in business. Oh, Candy, you want to speak up? 
Sure. Um, I'm currently in IBM also, um, 40 some odd years. And um, exactly what Lisa said, boy, she just said it for me, Slack and the number of channels and email and just how to find stuff and be effective and productive. It's, um, yeah, technology keeps changing and it would be great to understand how to get better control of it. Thank you. Marty. I've just retired from Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago, where I taught in the business school, predictive analytics, statistics, uh, sort of a chameleon started out in accounting, then information technology, and then the uh, data analytics area that I'm currently in. And I'm probably still going to be teaching as an adjunct uh, in some way with IIT remote because I'm in Los Angeles uh, right now. Uh, my interest in information overload is on two dimensions, the content that we see, whether it's through search or messaging that we get, but also the visualization. How much information can we pack into a dashboard or how do we design a dashboard so the content becomes digestible? There's all kinds of psychological aspects related to how we process information, attention, uh, et cetera, and that content. And I joined the uh, information overload group about 10 years ago, been active and uh, really excited about interacting with the group in information overload and the bonfire, which we get uh, kind of uh, new ideas popping up all the time. So that's great. And with that, we can get into the non-existent agenda. So anyone wants to raise an interesting question or subject for discussion or statement, go for it. Well, I hear that Slack is a issue amongst at least two of the group today. And I'm just thinking about span of control back to my academic uh, side. And uh, Peter Drucker actually changed that from span of control, the number of projects or people that you manage to span of information. And that certainly sounds like the Slack question. Uh, how do you, you know, filter, prioritize, uh, decide what channels are uh, looked at more frequently? Uh, what's the importance of the content? Uh, that really is a uh, attention challenge. I can appreciate that. I don't know, Henry, since you've moved away from uh, just email to search, if there's anything that you or your you know, company is doing in terms of uh, scanning multiple sources uh, almost simultaneously. Yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, I actually, I just had a, a thought. <clears throat> I was chatting with a, a friend and they had a similar um transition within their company as well they they moved everything over i mean they had the email obviously to discuss and, and communicate with external folks but internally they were using slack primarily and in the beginning it seemed like it was a much better it, it was a good decision but over time as i'm sure as lisa mentioned you, know, you just have hundreds and hundreds of now channels that you have to monitor and i i think this uh i, I don't have the solution for this but i i think the the underlying the root cause of uh, of information overload is it doesn't really matter what platform it's it's what is our priority, you know what depending on your profession we're all going to have different roles and responsibilities and what is the what is it that we're looking for and so we can move from email to Slack or and then whatever the next platform will be but we're information overload is always going to be there if we don't have control over that and my theory on that is, or what I'm hoping is if we can analyze text to help you identify what it is that you need to find to, to complete your tasks or do whatever you need to do. I think that is the, the approach that, that needs to be taken. But a lot of these companies or whether it's another product, just creating a beautiful new interface, but it's not solving the problem. Um, and that's ultimately how do we minimize all of these unnecessary distractions? How do we focus in on only the stuff that we need to see? Um, but that's just, I guess I'm kind of rambling there, but that's just my thought, 
you know, I mean, I haven't figured out, I don't know if anyone has, but I think that is the right way to go about it. it we can go from email to Slack to the next platform, but it's, it's, it's always going to be there until that, that part of it is solved. If that made any, if that made sense. Oh yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I was just about to say that today is Slack, tomorrow Slack, Microsoft Teams, any kind of collaborative application share the same thing. You know, uh, there'll be always um, uh, ad hoc communication. So I think the underlining thing is that how to be, how to organize, how to organize and how to be transparent. And of course, sometimes we, we tend to, you know, take um, take a lot on our plate than we can manage, you know. So that kind of a tendency we need to really, you know, control. So I totally agree. So I think some of the solution for email that would be applicable, uh, this like, you know, set up a time to check or all kinds of stuff thing that we do that would be applicable for any kind of collaborative software. I totally agree with you. Yeah, by the way, it's easy to say, yeah, let's abandon email and go to Slack, which is way more modern and so on, except that we need to be careful not to go too far. I remember Google Wave, which was the, really the future in the present, it was amazing. All this color, all these photos, all these little icons of people and so on, and it became overcomplicated and they had to actually fold it and stop it. It became too overloading and it's even the interface, I think. So, I think the co collaborative software has additional challenge than email because it is a real time. So it is going to be how much of a try to avoid it. Um, if you decide, you will have to sign up for notification anyway, otherwise you will be completely cut off. So it will be, you know, the effectively, it's going to hinder your work. So the challenge is how to take proactive action before it starts doing it. You know, that's one other thing. And um, uh, I mean, maybe, maybe as, as and like, uh, signing up all the channels should not be a way to do like a, having few critical things that matters sign up that and rest when you're in slack you can browse that because everybody wants to do like click multiple groups and some of sometimes these groups overlap and it's also challenge uh because you you run into a one particular issue now you have to decide which we you're going to put your question in which channel. So it's kind of a lot of these things. So I think overall thing is that one has to organize. It becomes sort of hygiene, you know, like an email hygiene, collaborative software hygiene. Yeah, so I don't check Slack. I already, I already only check email a couple times a day. And I do the same thing with Slack and I have all the notifications turned off except for when I'm specifically mentioned or I get a direct message. But given what it is that I do, I can't just pay attention to what is sent to me because I need to stay abreast of things that are happening and I can't just search. I guess I guess is what it gets down to. Just going in searching for information doesn't doesn't solve my problem because I need to I need to know if there's a new development in a in a particular area going on, and that's not something you can search for because you don't know what the new you don't know what it is you don't know, so you can't search for things you don't know, but you can scan and read the Slack channels and find things that you don't know. And then and then you go and search about additional information for it. But it's, I don't know, it's, it's I haven't figured out how to, how to address it other than like about once every two weeks that I try to just 
set aside several hours just to scan through the Slack channels that I don't need to pay attention to every day. I already have it set up so that, and I have it, I have them grouped so that the ones that I need to pay attention to the most are in a particular group. And so then I have this whole collection at the bottom that I just call info, a group called info that I go and scan through just to see, is there any development in an area that I need to pay attention to? I don't know how else to word it. Yeah, good strategy. I feel to do this if something like that. Yeah, I still have to wait too many Slack channels though. Or I feel like I have way, still have way too many Slack channels. Just occurred to me that we probably put a man on the moon without an email, right? And uh, oh, so yeah. I think, you know, Napoleon conquered Europe without uh, any of this stuff. He wasn't agonizing over how to deal with his communications. He was agonizing about how to crush his enemies or whatever. And the uh, same for anything up till 1970, probably. So it's a strange transformation of the world. So either well, this is except for we do know that, Yeah, we do know that, the, that NASA generated tons of paper. So I don't know that the communication wasn't happening. I think it was just happening in a different format. It was. And that format actually lends itself to, to other modalities. Like, first of all, they, they did have, you know, secretaries screening this stuff for them, no doubt. And secondly, <laughs> they didn't read so much of it because they couldn't. There's not enough room for all the paper in one office. So they must have had different systems of dealing with the information and the searching for it and recycling it and so on. Who knows? Yeah. Well, unfortunately, I'm not high enough on the food chain to have an assistant to scan all that stuff for me. <laughs> yeah. So I'm curious, um, is IBM using some email like Microsoft um, Outlook or um, there was a comment about IBM eliminated email. Did they eliminate it completely or are they still no, have no, it? No, it, they didn't eliminate email. We've just moved almost all of a lot I would say 85 plus percent of the internal communication now is via Slack. So, you know, where we used to get, so whereas we used to get email blasts about, you know, announcements about this, that, or the other. Okay. So, you know, there's going to be uh, an all hands call or, you know, an update on um, uh, organization moves or whatever. Almost all of that is via Slack now. Very little of it comes through email. Interesting. That means, that, well, we know they're not using connections, which was their own flagship product in this space. Now we quit using we quit using connections. We sold that. Um, we're using Slack and Box, and uh, we've we've actually moved to Microsoft Exchange. So we're either using Outlook. Or Apple Mail is the front end now. So we quit using Lotus Notes as the mail product. So we have moved away, but but still it's email, you know, it's email, it's a place to store files. And then we also have an internal, um, it's called W3 Publisher. It's just basically web pages, for lack of a better way of putting it. And that's what we use. So, but the but to get notifications about what's going on on Publisher, sometimes you get emails if you subscribe to blogs and things. But a lot of that is happening on Slack also because somebody will publish something on Publisher and then they'll go to Slack and say, oh, I published this, da da da, da and here's the link to it kind of thing. And so, but seriously, I, I mean, I couldn't even tell you how many Slack channels I have. Um, but it's, I'm pretty sure it's over a hundred that I have watched and you have to be, you have to have joined the Slack channel to be able to scan it for information. So there's not an option to not have joined it. I can, mute so you, it. I can mute it and some I have yep. muted, but, um, because they had way too many at here's and at channels. <laughs> so you need a tool to manage 
those hundred channels, like to give you an aggregation or a dashboard or um, some way to navigate that. So I'm at a startup right now and there's only about 50 people so far in the company. We started using Slack and then nobody used it. So we stopped. Um, we do chat in uh, Microsoft Teams once in a while. And if we do like the lunch and learn, they'll put the recording, you know, from the lunch and learn in that, in that uh, whole team, you know, chat. So I don't know. I think of, of messages like Slack and, and chat and Microsoft Teams as being quick ways to see if somebody's available to talk or short, you know, information update. Um, my mind is just trying to think through, wow, if that was my, my main way of communication and getting work done across a hundred Slack channels, that, that sounds chaotic to me. <laughs> um, chaotic. And, so interesting and on that, that strategy. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's yeah. not that I'm doing work across all 100. I'm probably doing work across, I'd say, 10 to 20 of them. Okay. But I am doing work across multiples. It's not just a, a channel. But information that I need to be aware of comes in across the rest of them. I'm not familiar with Slack filtering, but are there means such as an email to put some sort of prioritization on notifications. I'm not sure if that would be helpful. I, I have, okay, so I have, I only get notifications if they do an at here or an at channel, which I, you can't cut those off, or I'm specifically mentioned, and then a few topics that are specifically mentioned. So I only get notifications in those cases, but I still, am able to see all of the unread messages highlighted in all of the different channels, even with the notifications turned off. So I don't get a pop-up in my face, but I still have an indication that it's there. Mm -hmm. So there's still this little nag that says, look at me, look at me, look at me. And it, it, it's good and it's bad because I know what I, I know the ones that I need to go scan and can ignore the rest of them. But yet there's the little nag that says, go scan me. <laughs> are you assuming that all of them are actually needed to do your job? No, I'm not. But, but I need to see if there's anything in them that I need to know about to do my job. Or more, that I need to go learn about to do my job better. So this is classic example of FOMO, fear of missing out. Well, <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Um, in technology, especially at IBM, if you don't continuously learn about new things, you get left behind. And so I don't know that it's fear of missing out so much as it's fear of being sidelined. Sure is that, yep. So I, yeah, I, I, made a career, I made a career out of connecting the dots, you know, so um, and, and a lot of times that connection, connection between different pieces of information is where you get breakthroughs, right? Otherwise, team would churn, right, until this piece of information came forward, you know, to help um, resolve the issue. So I think it's a balancing act. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here, Nathan, thinking too bad Lele is not on this bonfire. Lele works at IBM. He's been trying to eliminate email in his personal life for about seven years now and um, probably would have a whole lot of insights and thoughts on how to move forward without email. In fact, I think we have a recording or two on the web page from, from well, Lele actually, about working without emails. I've actually listened to Lele's things about email and it's not email I mean he, his whole thing was he moved away from email and to connections which got replaced by slack so it's not moving away from email I'm pretty much away from email it's how do I manage better the the flood of information that comes across slack there is that yep that and, will tell you 
I can tell you a story from way back, but at some point I was in charge of artificial neural networks in Intel Israel, and I was the only guy in the country in Intel doing that. Uh, and so all my friends, uh, whenever they came upon a paper or article about neural networks, they would Xerox it and send it to me. This was back then. And I had this huge pile of articles on my desk. And of course, I couldn't throw them out because they are in my subject of expertise. So my right. field was missing up. And the pile would grow. And uh, I would say, one day I'll find the time to read them. And of course, the day never came. And my morale would plummet as I grew. At some point, I had this epiphany, and I threw it all into the trash. And I said to myself, when the day comes when I have the time, I will buy the best book in the world about neural networks and read that instead. It's guaranteed to be better, right? Of course, the day never came, so that's okay. But uh, the point is, when we are looking into important stuff that others are sending us, it's not at all guaranteed to be the best we can do. We could probably get more focused benefit from selecting what we want to see rather than what other people want us to see. And, and I'm saying this without being too critical because uh, I worked at Intel, I've done the, whole, the same thing as everybody and I've been through the mess. But as a philosophy to think about, pull mode in a sense is more attractive than push mode when consuming information. Yeah, but I still have to have a mechanism for knowing what I want to pull. And that's what I'm using Slack for is to is to somebody post it. and it's not it's not usually even that the information that I get on Slack is the complete piece of information. It's a tickler about something that's like, oh, I need to go look at that. And then I do the pull that you're talking about. But without having the tickle, I don't even know that I need to go do the pull. It's, uh, yeah. So it's it's like I said, I hadn't figured this out. <laughs> yep, maybe what we really need is, is uh, you know, a kind of digest, weekly digest of all the important things in a given area, but somebody would have to curate that. Maybe the group could actually do together to save everybody time or take turns or I don't know. Yeah. I, I have a... Uh, Go ahead. Sorry, uh, Lisa, I, I have one... Um, it's not the easiest thing to do. Uh, it, it does take practice, but so I'm not sure how you search when you go into Slack. Um, I'm happy to try to help on a separate call once if you want and instead I can show you how I would query. But each of these platforms, and I know Slack's included in this, is they have their own like rules and restrictions on what and how you can run an advanced search. But the real interesting part is just, I think for me, just doing this for so long now and just watching others, People tend to, when they search, they tend to search the subject. So like a client name or a project name. Uh, but that often won't give you what you're looking for. Because if you if you typed in a client name, you're just going to get tons and tons of results. And, and I don't know what those development, uh, the projects that you're working on within your company, every company is different. But try if you can. Uh, you may not know what the project is or the upcoming development but you may have the idea around the context. So if you use the keywords around context and build out a query like that, uh, you might be able to uh, pinpoint down precisely what it is that you're looking for. And, and that's kind of how I started my, the email uh, productivity toolkit. We were building these email filters essentially based on the context around your priority. So not necessarily the word receipt, but the other variables around what a receipt is. So dollar values and, um, you know, subtotal tax and all that. And that would actually dictate and say, hey, this is this is more likely a receipt rather than just scanning for the word receipt, if, if that makes sense. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to, to help you, you know, write a query. Out. And also, I know Slack's, there's there's no universal standard language. Everyone has their own uh, query languages. So I can I can help you create one at least there. OK, thanks. Oh, anyway, I should give you a rule I once used in the early email days. I had a rule that if it doesn't contain my first name, which is rare enough, then it, it's not important to me. You know, it must be a generic one. That, uh, you know, that, that gave me a pretty pinpointed focus on at least the most relevant ones. So either somebody responding to something I found when I wrote them, or somebody 
you know, talking to me and giving my name at the top. Yeah, that's, I, I'm, I'll have to go back with, I know Gmail and Outlook, they have different um, syntax, but it is doable. It, it's essentially, you would create a rule around that whole, hey, if, if the word, if the name or the phrase Nathan is excluded in this, then perform this action, which is essentially move it to spam or delete it, unless it's a reply. Yeah, definitely that's something I can, I can help you out with. Although search is becoming, you know, more and more smart, too smart maybe for its own good. In a sense, it used to be when in the early Google days or even before Google in the Alta Vista days and so on, if I wanted to find something written by some idiot that I know misspells a certain word, I could find it because I would do a full Boolean search and would include the misspelled word. Google, of course, would assume that I meant the correct spelling today. And it's no longer <laughs> even remotely possible to tell it even if you use quotation marks and this and that and, and minus and plus, it still does whatever it feels like doing. And it's getting uh, actually really smart at it. So 99% of the time it really fits what you want. And the 1% where you really look for something uh, you know, specific, then you're... Remember, I once actually solved a bug. I found a bug in Microsoft itself, I think, like in, in the Visual Basic, library or something, because uh, something would happen to the scroll bar would double in size and start acting weird and so on. And the way I found it is by looking for, for the keywords, plus words like crazy and maddening and insane and so on, because I figured somebody talking about this, but that's what they would feel. And I found it. <laughs> so you need to be able to pinpoint what you want to look for, but uh, with all the more and more AI getting into it, a small chance of that. By the way, what does everybody think about this Google engineer that managed to almost get fired for saying that his chatbot became sentient? Have you seen that one? I heard about it. Yeah. So I'm sure this current uh, version of his chatbot isn't. But uh, what do you think about the trend and the fact that he felt that way? This is an engineer. So he's not an idiot by definition. So what's going on? I mean, I think it's an interesting, uh, I, I read, I briefly read the article when it, when it came out a couple of weeks ago, but um, it's kind of frightening, but um, at the same time, I think, how would I word this? Uh, I think it could all, also just be the media hyping it up and making it seem um, bigger or crazier than, than it could be. Cause I still see a lot of AI companies and, and some of the biggest companies trying to do AI. And it's, um, I think we're still, we've got a long way to go until something that powerful could be. But then again, he is, like you said, Nathan, is is the engineer and he's, he's pretty much the brain behind it and probably has more insight than I do and the rest of the world. So maybe that's why it's a little frightening when you when you read things like that. But it's kind I don't of know, interesting. Yeah. Mind you, people will believe, I mean, Eliza, right, which was the level you could write in basic, uh, convinced people that it was a life therapist and what it was doing is, was completely obvious you know, this in the 1960s. So if you look into the transcript of this bot, it, it's definitely impressive and, and it could easily convince people uh, because people would be convinced easily in general. But again, for the engineer who wrote it to think so is, is over the line, probably. Nathan, what was the net? What was the net of what happened? I didn't see the article and I didn't follow what, so what the, he claimed they had, happened. They, they seem to have this tool, Lambda, I think it's called, for developing chatbots. And this engineer was working on it, uh, had a conversation with it and became convinced, or at least he wrote a letter to management saying this chatbot is conscious. No subjectively conscious like a human being and we should take that into account and so on and you know, maybe not turn it off or whatever and then they gave put him on some kind of uh, probation or you know they, they almost fired him and he's waiting to see what they'll do with him the engineer got the chatbot 
which, uh, okay. as I said, made the, the headlines, of course, and so on. All right, I'm going to... Go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I'm going to look that up. I seem to remember seeing something about Rhonda. Um, and I wonder if it's, you know, the choice of the word, it's conscious. Like, you know, what does that really mean? And, and to the prior point, did it get sensationalized? But uh, sounds very interesting. Yeah, I, I did the uh, um, news, uh, but I didn't know that he was about to be fired because Google said this certainly it is not that uh, what he said. But what is the reason of Google taking it as I mean seriously enough to fire someone over this? But probably they don't want the word going around that they're developing bots going that around. Are conscious because then they could uh, you know people would easily go into a conspiracy theory that Google will send those bots to take over the world uh, or whatever. So, so it could be defamation. Okay. So although I don't know, I'm not working with Google. So it is nowhere, nowhere close to conscious. Because thing is that we human beings haven't really figured out what consciousness is. That is true. So as a lot of uh, neuroscience uh, work is going in this direction, okay? We haven't figured out how our brain works completely. So with that says, so people can simply coin some words just to get click, you know, but in essence, it's not what people claim to be. Uh, this is the, the most, you know, the, this is the mind-body problem, basically. How does consciousness arise? And this is the most maddening problem, because it's a problem, you know, to die for the answer, and we're all going to die without knowing the answer. So it's extremely annoying, personally, I find it to be. But uh, on the other hand, so these systems are AI systems, and we know how they're built. Uh, I read one article, somebody said that the, the way to make a chat but uh, seem conscious is to make it vulnerable. Like this one actually explains what what fears it has and how it's depressed when it thinks about this or that. And by being vulnerable, it makes them more appealing in a sense. That was the theory of this particular uh, writer. But we'll see. Besides, so, this is what this spot does today. Think what the one from you know 20 years from now is going to be able to make us believe, and we'll see where that goes. Maybe it will become conscious at some point, just not yet. I appreciate someone has the foresight of seeing what legal issues could generate from this. That 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 can agree on that, but certainly not conscious machines. Well, Elon Musk has this company of his that is supposedly keeping an eye on AI developments to make sure that uh, they don't end up destroying humanity or whatever. Now, Elon Musk has a lot of ideas, of course, of various kinds, but it's interesting that he's investing in that. And my lecture about AI, I have this lecture about developments in AI that I give uh, in the Hebrew University, and uh, I uh, <clears throat> end it with the, the question of, you know, is this gonna be dangerous for humanity? And then I said, look, so Elon Musk thinks this is uh, more dangerous than nukes, I think he said. And we have Stephen Hawking said that AI could be the end of the human race. And then I tell them, I remember this cartoon from way back. It was this guy walking with a sign saying the end of the world is near, repent and so on. And there's these two guys in the cartoon. One of them says, oh my God, oh my God. The other guy says, what do you mean? You know, we see these guys all over the place that there's nothing interesting in it. And this guy says, yeah, but this one's Carl Sagan. So, you know, when it's Stephen Hawking, you better pay attention. <laughs> oh, well, we'll see. Anything else about information overload we want to discuss today? We diverged a little. I have a, I've got a, something I, I came across recently. Have, have, has anyone here heard of a bionic reading? Oh. So I, I definitely struggle with this sometimes, even though I can query effectively. Uh, I may end up pulling the right document, but it's like 60 pages long, so I have to actually read it. Uh, but sometimes with just so much going on, it's like my brain, I just 
I, I try to go through it as quickly as possible. And I actually end up not reading the whatever document correctly and effectively. Uh, but bionic reading is this new study that came out and there are tools now that do this, but they basically highlight or put the first few letters of each word in bold. And apparently the study claims that your brain processes the word faster than your eyes can, and it actually can help you read it. So I'll, I'll link it in here. There's, there's other, you know, third-party plugin tools for different um, apps that you use, but uh, this one, you can just copy and paste a large piece of text and, and put it in and I'll, you can convert it. And then you can try reading it. I, I think some people love it. Some people hate it. <laughs> some people are skeptics. I tried it. It, it, it does help. I would say it's, it's slightly, uh, I, I don't know. It's just, you're just able to read uh, without like the little breaks and hiccups in, in your brain. Yeah. Um, but if anyone wants to give it a shot, Thank you. I, I have not heard about this one, but I, I came across this uh, strategy of how to read faster. So basically, you don't have to read the entire paragraph. There are um, scan uh, strategic position of that one and get the gist of it. So uh, like, uh, uh, like how to do many things. There's one of those things my earlier long, long time, like decades ago. I learned that this is how you consume what is in an article or any book or anything like that. Okay? Of course, it will not give you a pleasure of actually reading a nice good book for literary reasons, but that's what it is. But, but he, he, that's very interesting. For, thanks for sharing. So my question is that who does highlight that one? Is, is there a tool does it or... Yeah, the, the, well, so the tool is, well, the one that I sent, that's the one that I knew, but I, I know there are other tools out there. Um, it's the tool will convert it. So it's just pretty much a text editor and you can copy and paste whatever text. If you were to read an article, you can do it. And it's, it's basically just highlighting or putting the first few letters or the first letter in bold. Um, but it's, I, I guess I just, I want to share because it is fascinating for me, when I when I do use it and I start to read, I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, I am reading a little faster, and just it's just boom, boom, boom. And it's, I, I guess your brain really does just process the word for you faster than you have to visually go through each word as you're reading. Um, but I've seen on Facebook where they they have these demos where they have text where most of the non-first letters are are either messed up or turned upside down or whatever, and you don't notice even. Yeah, I think it's, I think I, when I read the article originally, it was, it was all around that as well. Yeah. And of course, if we want to bold the first letters of every word, <laughs> you could do it in with a macro in Word, you know, yeah. it's easy to do. So we could do it ourselves. Interesting, I'll definitely take a look at it. I remember decades ago, there was the Evelyn Woods Reading Institute that provided speed reading uh, classes. So this mm -hmm. is the technology update for it yeah that's exactly how i was talking about speed rating yeah yeah <laughs> yeah long time ago but at that time not so much of thing happened so here uh, henry just a quick question uh, you you tried this one you said right you tried okay, okay. so how, how does it like a, you you feed your article or information through this one or you open it and call an API and then convert it? Yeah, so uh, right now it's just manual. I think they maybe have an extension, but I never downloaded any of the apps or plugins. I just, oh, okay. their editor and I just copy it and you hit generate and then it will just spit out the, the same text, just they just put everything in bold. Cool. Yeah, as Nathan said, you could technically do this yourself. Um, if you wanted to, but it's just yeah, of well, course the converse is to teach everybody to touch type fast. <laughs> <clears throat> People don't, and with the smartphones actually, you know, getting a screen with your fingers, there's probably techniques to do that faster or slower. And nobody in the company goes around making sure everybody uses the faster mode, even though they spend half their day writing. So, and here we have Julia. Julia, we will give you the the thing we gave everybody. The beginning you can present yourself briefly welcome sure um hey everyone thanks for having me today um it's funny that the bonfire happens on almost the the summer solstice in the northern hemisphere because the 
tradition and what I did the uh, past two days is have a little fire. So it seems like it's a very timely thing. Um, I am internal communications and employee experience manager at a startup. Um, it's a knowledge management startup. So we think a lot about how to reduce information overload, but I'm personally, and I've met Margie and some of the other folks on this call, but personally really passionate about it in terms of making sure that a generation of children have more space for daydreaming and imagination. And those are the kind of the things that keep me up at night. And I think it's all related to how we interact, build policy and guardrails around tech. So always want to learn from other people who've been doing it for a while and are also curious. Hey, I love the daydreaming. The general manager of Intel Israel, who is the, the guy who invented the EPROM, so, you know, he's a smart fellow, he is, wrote a book about his philosophy and he said that uh, it's critical to enable people in high tech to daydream because you know, it, it plays various useful functions that I won't go into now, but uh, it was the other guy that cared about daydreaming. So. Yes, love. Um, I'm, I'm reading this lovely book, um, uh, Johan Hari, and I'll, set, I'll share it in the chat, but it is about um, stolen focus, why you can't pay attention, and it has some solutions. Um, and I think this crew would definitely um, find it interesting, but he talks a lot about like what happens when we daydream and like productivity, uh, uh, connecting to purpose a bit more when you give your spouse more space and time without lots of information happening. So that's my contribution for today. Yeah, I read that book. It's very nice. Actually, oh, I you did referred, nice. I, I referred the book in my chapter, um, Nathan. Say the what, the, like internally a chapter that I'm creating. So I oh, I'd love to too. see that. Uh, I'd love to sh to see that. If um, and sorry if I missed it. If it's in the information overload somewhere. Um, no, we, that's not published yet. It's a work in progress. Yeah. So basically. I was referring, I read that book and uh, there are other, uh, you know, books also like uh, Power of Habits, specifically how to improve. So, you know, well, they're all uh, interrelated, basically. Habit, you know, how to attention, focus. So the underlining meaning is that how you can achieve more in a sh most shortened time. So that's what it is. Because we have only just 24 hours a day. It's true. Um, and the same, I thought um, Hari's pointing out, which we might already know, is like our human brain doesn't have more capacity than it did. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 100 years ago. So it's like we have the same amount of time and the same like sort of brain functioning and then the amount of things we need to digest are like that. Yeah. Um, it's Hi, Margie. Hello. I was going to ask you for the, the spelling of the name and then I saw you put it in the chat. So thank you. And I love the idea of um, imagination and creativity and childlike um, thoughts and thinking. You know, I've even done that in a couple of business problems where I said, what questions would a child ask? Or I usually say a dumb end user. I, I step out of the discussion and act like I know nothing about the topic and, and ask questions. And sometimes there are obvious questions that nobody thought of, right? So I, I think that creativity and quiet time um, and imagination is where the genius um, will spark. Um, also, um, I don't know if you guys got a chance to hear Adam. He is, he's a neuroscientist. Actually, he's also a professor um, in California. Uh, so USC, I believe. 
so here's um I, i'm going to give you the youtube link also it's just a um, such a this thing so he, he this is talks about the, how mind gets distracted the very uh very the, the way he opens it is basically you were doing something and you thought of uh suddenly you remember that you have a drink or milk in your refrigerator and you want to go and grab it and you just went go to your kitchen and open the freeze and all of a sudden you realize that you don't know why you are at, at the refrigerator because suddenly you forgot okay and people try to um try to attribute it to old age but it is not old age it's just a, you're you at the time you were you were thinking of doing that one your mind was distracted so it's totally really gelled into and then you go there and then you see this it's a very nice and this person he he really talks nice um i'm going to um he has a book actually the distracted mind but uh, how well he has but uh, this this about a a uh, nice uh, lecture that he had uh, given this is a this special link on that adam gasly okay we got it yeah so there's so many articles so many things there and it's very exciting it's just like a like there are lots of games to uh, to make you learn all those things but the searching for information itself like you feel like it's a game you know so many everyday new treasure comes and interesting yeah but how do we package all the solution in the one or two maximum that's the trick that we have to do oh. there's henry henry probably could give us some pointers on that i'm sorry what was the the last part? i was actually reading the the description in the amazon page yeah for the book no, there, there are there are lots of good books and good um points and everything is there and it's just a treasure hunt you know every day learn something however how do we package everything and actually create a solution out of it yeah yeah it's a great question i uh i mean i don't know the answer myself but uh what we're doing i think is working and that is um and i think this goes to uh marty you had mentioned earlier in the chat as well something about the eisenhower uh, matrix Hawks. i think it i think it's a it's a useful tool uh but what i think people overlook is that 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 fourth bottom right quadrant i forget how it looks but the just do delete or just get rid of that is the first step i think just to basically create a not to do list right like what you don't do defines what you should do and from there if you create a decision matrix it is significantly easier it's because we spend so much time like for example if you jumped into your inbox and you have 100 emails and statistically speaking 70 80% of it are just junk you're going to delete those things but to to spend brain power to think about that and consider whether or not you should delete or do it later or delegate it 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 adds up it adds up over time so i think the very first step if if there is to be a solution i think the proper first step is to get rid of all that nonsense out of the way and with the remaining 20% of the or 30% of the emails or information that you have apply maybe this eisenhower matrix or another solution but i think it's that's i think the very first step is it's critical to get rid of all the stuff that you don't need otherwise you're just you're still wasting um brain power on that there is also a uh, decision point how do you know that you do not need it because if you already know you don't need it it's very easy to get rid of but somewhere um as lisa was saying like you know we don't know yet because uh, it may be useful so there is somewhere the parking lot and the parking lot is if not visited and the parking lot gets full very easily yeah 
<laughs> it's funny. I, I don't know the answer, but just from my own personal experience, I, I, I've learned now uh, nine out of 10 times, it's not something I need and I'm just dwelling on it. Um, very few occasions, maybe, so maybe once or twice has it happened in the past where I, I thought I was going to need it, but I deleted it and I was like, oh, crap. Majority of the times, uh, looking back now, we rarely ever need it. And I think if you do need it, you would know. Like you would know or whoever is communicating with you would make it explicitly clear. But that that was also, my workflow is obviously different. You know, uh, Lisa might be working on much larger projects that have, you know, all these different factors and variables, so. So I have a kind of a dirty secret the way I manage this. Usually it happens end of the day, that's what, end of the year. That's why I love that during Christmas break, you know, three days, three, four days here and there, uh, it's uh, office is empty, work is light, so you can go do it. So what I do is um, all uh, create a folder for the, that particular year <laughs> with a name and push everything there. <laughs> And the following month, you know, January to next three, four months, if something comes, I know it is important because I know what I'm pushing, but I don't know the detail of that. And then I bring it back. So I do have some year, year, year folders. So don't have to worry about, you know, all the things. That's not, so a bad, not a good strategy, but it somehow keeps my inbox clean. This uh, reminds me of, do we need the information today or are we thinking maybe tomorrow or maybe six months from now we need it? So we stuff it in a folder and it's a push down stack, which uh, has no bottom. It's like my basement, my information basement, everything goes there. <laughs> Actually, what I was having and I was teaching this, what I call the five weeks method, which involves, and I'm using it today actually, uh, involves uh, having a folder that's called five weeks and anything that I hesitate more than two seconds, whether to delete or not, goes in there. And then I can find it later. And why, you know, then I don't have to be afraid that I will want it later, even if I really usually never do. But the point is it's called five weeks because I invented it in the times where storage was expensive. And then I would set it to auto delete after five weeks. Of course, today storage is dirt, so that's not even a problem. I just let it fill up, but uh, it still keeps that name. Yeah, that, that's funny you mentioned that, Nathan. Uh, so one of the things that people have asked us was uh, for for this email product that we have is, hey, can you? We help folks manage email moving forward, but there are people that sign up and you know they have eighty thousand emails in their inbox, and they say, hey, can you help us like retroactively remove these emails? And we can. Um, but I think everyone's priorities are different. So we just want to be cautious because once we remove the emails, it's, you know, you can't get them back. But one thing came out of similar to what you just mentioned, for example, promotional emails, a lot of people just have clogged, you know, an outdated promo email, but the technology, and I don't know why Gmail and Outlook doesn't do this. Like they, you can analyze the text, basically create queries and say, Hey, look, this promotion was valid till December 24th. 12.59 p uh, 11.59 p.m. in 2021. There's clearly no value in this coupon or promo sitting in your box. It should just automatically be weeded out, right? But it just sits there and that number just keeps ticking upwards and upwards and upwards. Um, that's something that we're trying to, to, to develop and, and to build, um, but it's just, it, it's kind of going back to what your solution that you were just mentioning. It's, you can, you can play with the dates, a lot of the things are just outdated. Um, and I think we can get a lot of that out. It, it solves a lot of the, the- As long as you have a good search tool to find stuff on your computer, which I do. Yeah. I don't care if there's a lot of stuff in there. In fact, I got the idea for that folder, I think, from a story about the government minister that was here in Israel in the 60s, I think. And he had this, this little cabinet with drawers under his desk. And so everything, every mail I got, which was paper, went in the top drawer. After a week, each drawer would go one notch down. And when they reached the floor, they would go into the trash. And his philosophy was, if it's important, they're going to call me about it anyway. So. That's kind of my life philosophy, too. 
life and work, just if it's important, someone's going to follow up. How much, what kind of like question for the group, how much do we think the sort of decluttering, if you will, or the, the sifting through information should be like a personal responsibility, an organizational responsibility, or um, I think to, to Henry's point, like how, how often are people buying tools to, to actually do the, um, to find the signal through the noise? Like, what's the measure of it being our responsibility, even our government's responsibility? Um, that's a big question, but something that I think about. One thing I think is if your organization went around deleting stuff on your inbox, there would be hell to pay. I mean, psychologically, even though it would be a favor, but uh, people would be extremely upset about the privacy and so on and so forth. So it would need a major cultural change. For people to agree to let anyone go through their mail. Traditionally, right. oh. going through the mail is a big deal, right? Yeah, I wouldn't I wasn't suggesting that, but like how much like should an organization give you like, hey, we offer, and I don't know the name of Henry's tool, but like we offer access to this tool to reduce um sort of information overload. Um, or should that be like a personal thing that you know, you, Nathan, have strategies that you've developed and you can share them with people, which is what you're doing there, but here. Um, I see what you're saying. Well, part of my job at Intel, which, you know, I invented, so I took it on myself to convince the company to provide training and tools and everything to help people cope with their overload. Uh, and I made some progress with that, at least. So as far as I'm concerned, if the company wants to provide the tools, great. If the government wants to do it, that may be a good idea, actually. And if not, people should be able to install whatever they want, which their company may or may not try to fight them doing it because, you know, it's not secure for IT reasons and so on. It's a big uh, fight, actually. But these days, what will bring your own device and so on? I think people mostly do it for themselves. If they fall in love with the tool, they will do everything they can to use it. What I, I experience is that at the company level, uh, of course, I've, I worked all bigger companies. Uh, it's like a more of a policy driven. They'll say, these are the two, like a retention period or a how to communicate. So it's like a generalized guidance instead of us having specific tool. Because nowadays, people like uh, whether it's Outlook, Gmail, or any email systems, they are pretty, pretty self-sufficient. You can do lots of things in that, you know. So olden days probably it was not so. That, that's why the lot of um, small apps came into play. That's easier. So um, that's another thing that what Nathan said is that integrating such tool um, with the email system is a bigger, you know, issue because these tools will be new version, new upgrade. So you are basically putting one more product in the mix that you have to maintain. So basically it's not really, it's not a one size fits all. It's a, it's a kind of a, if you're doing an investment, you have to know what is the return on that investment? So it's like a decision is subjective. Right. Well, the problem is, of course, the, the, many of the good tools come from small companies, and the tools that big companies like to buy come from red one, basically. So that's a, a dilemma. At some point at Intel, we had what we called, let me see, what did we call it? Forget the name, actually, but it was basically a sandbox. We had an organization that I was in that was called IT Innovation. So we did a, a sandboxed environment where any employee could bring in recommendations for new startup type tools. And we would vet them that they're not dangerous in terms of viruses. And then we'd put them so anyone in the company could download them from the sandbox and use them and be assured that they're safe. But we didn't provide support. And then they would feed back to us and that, of course, would give us access both to what are the good tools 
and what are the more innovative early adopters in the company. So it was valuable to us. But um, I don't know if other companies do that, actually, it may be unusual. I like that approach. It's sort of like you make it self-serve, but you've already vetted that a tool could be involved. We kind of do that in my my company. You know, like the comms IT team make sure before people add things to Slack or download something that it's like part of a library and then we let them deal with how to set it up. <laughs> oh yeah, they can do that. They're smart. At least for a few years until the overload gets to them, they're pretty smart people. <laughs> Well, I've got a, I've got a jump. Uh, just, I didn't realize I had a meeting at twelve, so I'm eight minutes late. But this was, uh, this was a, a great chat. I, I really enjoyed this, so I will definitely be joining on the next one. Nathan, is this every month or is this every quarter? Nominally every quarter. Okay, I'll, I'll make sure to, to be the on the next one. But thank you, thank you for setting this up. I really appreciate talking to everybody. Thank you. And I don't have a meeting, but I'm late for dinner, actually, given where I am. <laughs> so I think I will bring this meeting to an end. Good seeing you all. Let's come again. Take Thank care, you guys. all. Thank you. Thank you. We will have the recording on our website or YouTube channel before long, if you're interested in replaying it. So bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you.